Hey guys, Matt Easton here. I'm here with Scott Brown. Um, <coughs> Scott, as some of you will know by now, is a, a famous sword and bucklerist, uh, or at least that's pretty much his specialisation these days. Um, and uh, I figured there's something to be said, a few interesting things to say, about the uh, rapier and dagger as opposed to the sword and buckler, um, both in terms of the transition from one to the other in history and uh, potentially a discussion over uh, which is better in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Okay, So uh, first up it's worth saying I suppose that the sword and buckler, uh, what we've got here is a, a basket hilted um, back sword, in this case it could be a double edged broadsword, doesn't really make a huge difference, uh, but we've got a basket hilted sword with a buckler. And these are uh, a companion that were quite popular um, across Europe, but uh, particularly also in, in England until quite late. Uh, the rapier came to England relatively late in European terms um, and the basket hilted sword and buckler used together um, were popular throughout uh, a good chunk of the 16th century and then sometime around the middle of the 16th century perhaps later 16th century actually maybe more like kind of 1580s kind of period the rapier and dagger seems to have kind of taken over as the uh, civilian gentleman's sidearms of choice um, so, why do we think that might be? Well, Scott, any ideas? <laughs> uh, well, I think you've got a number of factors, and I think there's a lot of unanswered questions, but, uh, you know, I think the rapier became, well, partly fashionable, right? I mean, I think it was a, a custom among certain cultures, and, and particularly more educated men. Uh, you've got the rise of the you know, the, the dueling codes in Italy that kind of spread rapidly you know, across France and eventually into England and everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I think that that had a large influence on the, uh, basically the warlike weapons being less, carried less often because they tended to be placed in times of war more so than walking around weapons, civil self-defense weapons. Uh, that, um, but I think that's an important point and the, the code duello um, as it was known, the, the sort of essentially the Italianate sense of dueling and all of the, the culture that surrounded dueling that really came to uh, Northern Europe in, in the uh, sort of middle or latter part of the 16th century. Uh, came with a weapon set, and that weapon set really was the rapier and dagger. Um, I mean, the sword and buckler was still retained, it was still used in war, um, but it just seems that amongst certain social classes, the, the rapier and dagger became more popular in civilian life. And of course, it also coincides, in, in England at least, with the time when Italian teachers started to turn up in London. So we know that in the perhaps kind of 1580s, 1590s, uh, teachers like Saviolo suddenly rocked up in London and opened schools and this was really a kind of new thing for these commercial um, schools that weren't part of any, they weren't part of the company of uh, Masters of Defence for example, they were their own entity, own commercial enterprises and they really only sprung up in London certainly from about the 1580s, 1590s um, and Saviolo of course published uh, his, uh, his manual, his treatise in uh, 1595 um, before George Silver incidentally, and I have seen some websites um, listing George Silver as the first English uh, fencing treatise in 1599, therefore obviously he wasn't, because Saviolo, although he was Italian, actually published in English in, in 1595. Um, and in fact Degrassi had been published, I think a tad earlier than that, about 1593, something like that. Um, very slightly earlier, Degrassi's uh, rapier, essentially rapier, you could argue it's maybe late sides or but uh, and you could argue the same thing for Saviolo incidentally Saviolo and Degrassi are not typical rapier as we think of with Fabrice or um, sort of uh, later later rapier sources but um, but nevertheless these Italian systems were coming into England and of course they'd come into France probably a decade earlier than that uh, with the associated weapons and the Italian teachers for them so it was really a newfangled thing and certainly English sources at, in that period, and you know George Silver being one of the most famous examples, talk about the, and the new weapon, the new long, very thrust-centric sword, um, being a foreign 
uh, sort of thing being brought in, a new, a new weapon. It wasn't an evolution of the existing weapons, but certainly within Northern Europe, it was a new weapon coming from Italy. Um, I would also, I think it's also worth mentioning about sword and dagger because sword and dagger had been practiced earlier, uh, if we look at Morozzo for example, and George Silver does talk about the use of the sword and the dagger together. Um, why do you think the sword and dagger might have come about as opposed to the sword and buckler? Do you think it's something to do with ease of carrying or...? I, I think that's probably largely it. Um... You know, a dagger is a multifunctional thing. I mean, it's just as good for eating with as it is for defending yourself with. Mm. Um, whereas a buckler, and also if it's carried in that context, it's mm. in a culture where everyone's carrying a dagger, it's a lot less seen as a lot less offensive. Where a buckler has one real task, and that's mm. you know, it's to commit mayhem or to defend from mayhem, as it mm. were. So walking around city streets and whatnot is. It's based, I mean, and, and Silver talks about this, right, with, you know, the ruffians running around playing a sword and buckler. Um, so it sort of, a, you know, gives a presence of looking for trouble or being willing to accept it if it comes around, at, at the very least. Whereas a dagger, you know, it, it's, it's more a like a dress, uh, yeah. it can be more like a dress accoutrement, I suppose. I mean, especially the way they're often worn, uh, quite uh, inconspicuous at the back there, horizontal on the belt, where you can draw them out of the left hand quite quickly. Um, so yeah, and, and like you say, right the way through the Middle Ages, pretty much everybody had worn a knife or a dagger. So just turning that knife or dagger into one of these, into a mangosha or a left hand dagger, is no big yeah. change. And it means then you're only wearing the sword, you're not wearing the sword and the buckler jangling around off the side of it. Um, it's interesting though, as I mentioned before, we do, we do know that the buckler was still used up until about 1600, was still a popular companion, in fact for the rapier and the sword. Uh, although usually more for the more for the broadsword and backsword rather than the rapier, um, I've talked in a previous video about that. My view is that actually daggers are better at dealing with thr long thrust centric weapons because you're able to uh, deal with thrusts, trap thrusts, parry thrusts, and trap the blade more easily than you are with a buckler. Um, I think bucklers personally are not so good at dealing with thrusts. What do you? Think? Well, I think that depends on the buckler. Yeah. Um, you have a number of bucklers, the so-called Welsh-style bucklers, the uh, the Italian, you know, rippled bucklers, or wave bucklers, yeah. where the the targa. intent, the, yeah, the targa, yeah. tend to be the intent at least seems to be that uh, they catch thrusts. Mm. You've got other bucklers with with a, um, you know, they'll have a raised, a raised piece of steel ball. or a rim on it, uh, which that's a pretty clear indication that it's meant for catching thrusts. Yeah. So I do think it matters on the buckler. But then again, you could say that these in themselves show that people were trying to find ways for the buckler to be able to deal with, deal with thrusts better because bucklers aren't that good at dealing with thrusts. Absolutely, because all of those bucklers, with possibly the exception of the, quote, Welsh bucklers, mm. um, they're later. You know, they're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. mid, late 1500s at, at yeah. the earliest, generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and another thing I was talking with Scott earlier about this um, that we noted was that um, a number of sources deal with a type of sword, let's say a side sword or a rapier or, or a broadsword or backsword, with a dagger in the left hand of various types. Um, and the dagger is predominantly used to assist with parrying and, uh, and sometimes the dagger and the sword are used together and then you keep the dagger there so that you can then riposte with the sword whilst keeping the cover with the dagger in a similar way to how you use a sword and buckler. Um, but what's interesting is, I don't know of any sources, uh, be they fencing treatises or descriptive accounts really, of the sword and the dagger being used together before the 16th century. Um, I mean, not to say it didn't happen, but uh, sword and dagger seems to be, uh, sword and dagger or rapier and dagger seems to be a 16th century thing. Um, yeah, I, for whatever reason, maybe because it's a civilian thing, and maybe because widespread sword wearing didn't really come about until the 16th century in Europe. I mean, as we've discussed in previous videos in the 15th century, the knightly class may have walked around with a longsword, and certain types of uh, lower class people might have walked around with a messer, or uh, when they were travelling a sword and buckler, but generally speaking, people weren't walking around, or men weren't walking around in cities, wearing swords very often, 
uh, or, or, and in English and French cities it was indeed illegal. Um, whereas by the 16th century that seems to have gone out the window and lots of men seem to have started wearing swords. So I suppose in that situation that's when you might start supplementing your sword with a dagger as well because it makes you, you know, it gives you two weapons and makes you a bit better in defence, a bit better in attack. It, it, it may also have something <coughs> to do with just purely, you know, functional aspects. Frankly, with a sword and dagger, you have two weapons that are easily, you know, they're going to cut or going to kill, potentially. Mm -hmm. A buckler, certainly, obviously, you can do some damage with it, but it's, you know, unless it's got a, you know, sharp pointer on the front, or you've possibly sharpened the edges, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bludgeoning instrument, if it's used offensively. Yeah. Um, it's great for opening up tempo, uh, because it does stall and, and, you know, open the other free hand, much like a dagger. But it's not going to really kill or maim the way that a dagger was. So, you know, I think in some regards you may just have people taking the attitude, well, if one weapon's good, two is better. Yeah. Know? I actually think there might be there might be another factor involved here. We've um, talked in previous videos about how when you start to rely a lot on the thrust, you have a problem of dealing with the afterblow. Because if I run my sword into someone, whilst they might die of that wound, in that second it doesn't stop them from hitting me over the head with their sword, or indeed just running me through. And I've got to extract my weapon before I can give another attack or make a defence with it. And, um, we, you know, we've spoken how two options for this uh, that we see in different fencing treatises. Uh, one is to make sure that you only poke the blade a little way in and extract it out as quickly as possible. And the other option that's shown in a few rapier treatises is is actually to run the sword right the way up to the hilt and basically grapple with the opponent so they don't really have the chance to hit you with their sword. And in that situation, a dagger, as we've just said, because this is an offensive object, if I've run my blade into someone and they do close in on me, I can still stab them and maybe even cut them and fight with this object. And maybe a buckler is not quite so good at that. If you've got your sword stuck in an opponent and you haven't yet extracted it, um, maybe a buckler's not quite so good at finishing them off as a dagger is. Yeah, I mean, I think it's still something to deal with. Yeah, it's still but, in the way. Yeah, but yeah. it's certainly not a finishing item to the same degree. Yeah. Along the same tack as that, some people in the comments on my videos have, um, have commented that the buckler can be used to punch with um, sure. and strike with. But the thing that I come back with is, whilst that is shown in the treatises, and obviously you can hit people with it, it's a disc of iron on your fist. Um, would you agree with me that that is actually not shown very much in the treatises? No, it's not. Yeah. Um, it's implied, like, certainly in the 133 there are a number of techniques over wraps and whatnot where... And when you bump he, the other person's shield with it. Well, but... yeah. It's, yeah that, you know, for example, that's great for opening up a tempo. Yeah. But uh, even when they're going to over wrap and grapple with certain people, it's actually very hard, physically speaking, at speed to do that without cracking someone in the face. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they don't mention it as. But they don't. They don't. They certainly don't seem to emphasize that. They don't talk about it. Um, and the number of examples of clear, you know, strikes to someone uh, are are actually rather few and far between. Yeah. And I think from what from what I've seen, the same is true of the Bolognese sources as well. Marozzo, Manchelino. There, there's the the buckler is predominantly there as a defensive object. And you, you, in the Bolognese systems, you hold it out at arm's length and essentially fight around it. It's not really used as a striking object, uh, hardly ever, uh, in the Bolognese sources. So, uh, whereas the dagger in the rapier sources is used offensively in a lot of rapier treatises. So I think there, just taking the treatises at face value, we do have a suggestion that the dagger... Uh, whilst maybe it's not so good at defending against all types of weapons as the buckler is, um, is more offensive uh, than perhaps the buckler is. Um, just uh, the final thing I want to talk about is one-on-one -on -one fight. I know this is the kind of thing you guys like. One-on-one -on -one fight. One person's got a rapier and dagger. The other person's got a sword and buckler. Which one's better? Well, I don't think it's a question. But I think it's pretty <laughs> obvious. <laughs> sword and buckler? Of course. Okay, why? Depends on the context, right? I yeah. Mean, uh, in a street fight, in an alley fight, where you don't have a lot of room to move, I think the rapier and dagger takes over. I think if you've got an open, if you're in a courtyard or an open field, I, I'll put my money on the sword and buckler. Really? All things being equal. I wouldn't. 
In a one-on-one -on -one fight, I think the rapier and dagger has the massive advantage. Um, it's got longer reach, it's got more, more nimble in the point. Um, I, can, I can certainly deal with thrusts, uh, I think I can deal with thrusts better with this. I can maybe not deal with cuts quite as well as you can with your sword and buckler, but I have a lot longer blade than you do, so I think the reach advantage would really tell for the, for the rapier and dagger. I think it certainly matters, but again, so you get stuck thrusting through an arm, you know, now your weapon's up okay. occupied and now I'm I'm That's true, but then, but then you're hoping to be run through. So I'm not you hoping can then to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how these kind of discussions go, but uh, I personally think in a one on one fight the rapier and dagger has the advantage. And history might suggest yep. that actually that was the case because this took over from Sword and Buckler as the predominant civil, civilian gentleman's armament. But on a battlefield, I'd take sword and buckler every time because the fact of the matter is, rapier and dagger is not very good at dealing with a two-handed axe or a partisan or a spear or a spear and shield or sword and shield. Whereas the sword and buckler is really, it's more of a jack of all trades, I think. It can fight in the melee, it can fight one-on-one, -on -one, um, it can fight in groups. This is a rubbish in, if I'm fighting with, imagine you've got 10 people with rapier and daggers. It's not a very good uh, weapon set for fighting in any kind of uh, formation. Um, sword and buckler was popular as a, um, a, as a weapon set, both in civilian life and military life for how many hundreds of years? Uh, from essentially from the Dark Ages right the way through until until the 16th uh, century, and even in some places in the 17th century. Um, and I think especially when you start to get basket hilts coming as well, it kind of frees up the buckler to a certain extent because you're not having to protect the sword hand so much. Um, so any well, that's just focusing on the European traditions. I mean, yeah. there are still small shield and offhand weapon systems in existence today. And of course, yeah, and in India and the Middle East, the, you know, the Tilwar or the Shamshir or the Kilik were used with, with small shields uh, like the buckler uh, yeah. until the 20th century, in fact. Um, so yeah, absolutely, the small shield held in the fist and a sword, a cut and thrust sword, uh, or predominantly cutting sword, a uh, very popular weapon combination all over the world for um, for hundreds, even uh, thousands of years. Um, so there we go. I think I think. I just was going to yeah. say before you wrap up. Yeah. You should consider making a video discussing why the sword and buckler was used in armor in a number of uh, large scale battles. But that's another video. It is true. That is a good point. So generally speaking, I describe the uh, sword and buckler as in the armament for either a civilian person out of armor or a lightly armoured soldier like an archer or crossbowman or something like this. However, it is true to say there is medieval artwork which shows the sword and buckler used by guys in armour. Although I would caveat that by saying that uh, you've got artistic licence you always have to factor in. Sometimes an artist might be essentially an artist who's never been to war, he's never seen what happens at war. He's only seen civilians using swords and bucklers, but he knows people wear armour in war so he combines those two things. The other thing is I, ha I do know um, medieval examples of sword and buckler used in war with armour on where they don't have any leg armour on, so actually they're kind of wearing half armour and maybe they have a brigandine rather than a breastplate and things like this, so actually they're kind of, they are lighter armoured. And we have to also remember there are medieval pictures showing fully armoured men using longbows which is highly, highly improbable that they did. Okay, so you, obviously you can't trust all medieval artwork, but, but we do know for a fact Sword and Buckler was used by all manner of uh, medieval and Renaissance uh, soldiers, particularly archers, and people whose primary weapon was either a, a, you know, a gun or a, a missile weapon of some kind, or a pole weapon like a pike or a bill or a halberd. Um, so yeah, so my conclusion is that uh, rapier and dagger took over from sword and buckler partly because it was Italian and new, it was attached to a new style of fencing that was attached to uh, mathematics and geometry in the age of reason and science uh, and was very fashionable coming from Italy with the attached culture of the code duello um, and partly because in a one-on-one -on -one situation the rapier and dagger is perhaps superior in a dueling situation. Um, but the sword and buckler is still very, very awesome, 
um, and was um, you know, incredibly popular for a very long time and never truly disappeared in a sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you.